Well, it's, Pam has uh, given me the opportunity to visit this state for the first time. So I grew up in Maine, um, and we have mountains and rivers and so forth in Maine, but I went to Seward yesterday, not like this, and uh, it, it was a pleasure to see your state for the first time. It was on my bucket list, so now I can check that off. Um, and so, and I, I also wanted to sort of do what David uh, Carpenter did, which is I had prepared a, a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm basically going to try to go through it quickly or maybe even ignore most of it and tell a story about citizen empowerment, because I think that's really the spirit of what we're doing here today. Um, I should also say, as I think Carol said, which is that I'm on East Coast time, so I understand some of you need a nap right now. So do I, but uh, <laughs> if I fall asleep, that's my fault, not yours. Or... So, and then, as Carol did, I have to show a slide that says, here's what I'm going to say. Um, this is what they train us uh, academics to do. There's a guy at Boston University School of Public Health who said, um, he gave us a lecture to faculty as to you know, how to do lectures, and he said, you can take a scintillating, really interesting presentation and turn it into something dull and lifeless with PowerPoint. So I'm going to try not to do that, but I will go through it quickly. Um, so let me start with a few things about what we now know about parental, occupational, and environmental factors, or parental and uh, environmental factors, but the parental are mostly the occupational exposures, as often is the case. Workers are exposed more than anybody in the production of some of these new uh, chemicals that we've been talking about today. But the genetic factors, uh, the heritable factors that are due to something that's passed on year after year, are relatively few, very few actually, in childhood cancer. There's one that's called the Lee Fraumani syndrome, and that's actually a series of childhood cancers that are typical in families that have these particular defects to the spell checker gene. It's called P53. So that's been known for a while. I mean, it's a famous syn uh, syndrome, and it does result in cancer families. But it's a very small portion of the total cancer burden. And then likewise, something called the RB gene. RB stands for retinoblastoma. You have to have two copies of that, one from each parent, in order for that to result in a childhood you know, eye cancer. It's a, can a cancer of the retina, terrible thing to be born with. Um, but it actually is treatable. They call it enucleation, meaning they take the eye out, but then you can survive that. And that's a genetically her inherited type of cancer, very rare, thank God. Um, and or maybe thank the goddesses. Uh, I'm not sure quite how to say that these days. Um, but in any case, those are well-known heritable childhood cancers. And I'll say later that they represent maybe 10% or at the most 20% of childhood cancer. So the rest is environmental, as the previous speaker noted. Uh, it's things outside the body, and that can include a whole range of things, even prenatal exposures. Um, parental occupational exposures have been linked to childhood leukemia if the parents, and this is both parents, mothers or fathers, were exposed to solvents, pesticides, and motor vehicle exhaust. I'm going to cover a lot of territory with these bullet points, but there's references about all of it. If any of you are interested in getting deeper into it, uh, there's a very good review article I'll mention. This, um, the bottom of this page has a review that was done about 13 years ago by colleagues of mine at UMass Lowell. Um, so in any case, this is going to go by a lot of information quickly, um, and then I want to tell a story. Um, so parental occupational exposures have also been linked to childhood brain and central nervous system cancers. And again, if the parents were exposed to solvents, pesticides, and other hydrocarbons. So that's all fairly secure in the literature. Depends on who you ask, how secure. But my view is those things have been shown and they have been repeated enough in epidemiologic studies that they stand up. Um, here's some more about environmental exposures. Now, these are not necessarily parental, but children exposed to um, solvent-contaminated drinking water. The way I learned about that was because of the childhood leukemia cluster in Woburn, Massachusetts. And then a, a sort of a repeat of that same thing, childhood cancer in relation to solvent-contaminated drinking water in Toms River, New Jersey, basically, basically found the same thing, prenatal exposure to the kids because the mothers were drinking contaminated water while pregnant resulted in an increased risk subsequently of childhood leukemia, and at least in those two towns. 
Um, and then a third example of that occurred at a military base. Um, and air pollutants, air, environmental air pollutants now, and this is something really in the last 10 years that has become more secure, is that uh, it, you know, environmental air pollution and living near highly trafficked uh, streets seems to be related to increased risk of childhood leukemia from the environmental exposure breathing in air pollutants. Um, and then environmental and residential exposure to uh, pesticides and even pest strips, you know, the things that pull down and when you hang them in your house to catch the flies. Um, exposure to that and household pesticides seems to increase the risk of childhood brain cancer. There's a whole lot of other sort of less secure or less convincing uh, associations in the literature, but they're all summarized in this article at the bottom by Buka. She's the first author and co-authors in a uh, review that was published in 2007, which is actually, I think, the best single source I've seen on these environmental and occupational risk factors for childhood cancer. And so if you want, I have that somewhere here on my laptop, uh, but you can look it up um, on uh, Scholar Google or whatever source you use. So without belaboring those, there's a lot of information there, but those are the ones that I think are the most uh, secure. As you said, there's one other resource, which will be on a handout that the next speaker, uh, Madeline Scammell, after our panel, the next speaker will say, and it's a, uh, online resource called The Story of Health, A Story of Health. It was done by Dr. Ted Shetler, who some of you have, I'm sure, met. Um, somebody just raised their hand as if they know him well, um, and, and colleagues. And it's online at uh, a website that's sponsored by the University of California and also the Centers for Disease Control. For those of you who are healthcare providers and you need continuing medical education credits, you can get them from doing this online source and taking, I guess you take a quiz at the end. And it's also done in a way that it's accessible to non-physicians. And so it's a very useful summary of the literature. And it basically says, especially about childhood leukemia, it says the things that I just said. Um, we're also looking at teen cancer. Uh, I should first say that the most common, you can probably tell, the most common uh, cancers in children under the age of 15 are acute lymphocytic leukemia brain and central nervous system cancer, neuroblastoma, which is a, a tumor of the nerves of the sympathetic nervous system, so it's different from brain, but it's another neurogenic uh, cancer, and then Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then down from that, several other types. Uh, but the most common in that age group, under age 15, are uh, leukemia, especially acute lymphocytic leukemia, and brain and central nervous system cancer. And in the year 2014, it was estimated by the American Cancer Society that there were 10,450 cases countrywide in that age group. So it's very rare. I mean, there were a million cases of 1.6 million cases of cancer altogether in that year, but 10,000 of those were in those age below 15. And then the teen cancers, which is 15 to 19 as we look at it, those age 15 to 19 really haven't been looked at very much. But again, their childhood, I mean, it's not like people have, uh, you know, ha hazardous jobs where they're exposed to chemicals and get a cancer from it before they're 19. It's got to be something that they're exposed to perhaps even at an earlier childhood age or in the mother's womb. So that's worth looking at. It's also a fairly rare um, age group for cancer. It's like the zero to five year, or zero to four year olds. Um, it's a cancer that has approximately the same rates but a different composition, different types of cancer make up the overall rate in teens. So it's something that we at UMass Lowell are trying to take a closer look at. And so in that age group, the most common are Hodgkin's lymphoma, thyroid cancer, thyroid cancer, and then brain and central nervous system cancer third, and then testicular cancer, testicular and germ cell, but it's mostly in boys, so it's testicular cancer. Um, those are the leading ones in the teen years. So again, we need to look at that. It's a countrywide 5,330 cases in the year 2014 by the American Cancer Society estimates. Um, it's a tiny fraction of the overall burden, but it's, a, you know, a, it's an age group, the whole childhood age group is of critical importance to us for all the reasons that we've been talking about. This is the slide that Ruth already showed. Um, I was thinking, 
I've, all of this stuff I basically has already been said today, so I'm kind of just repeating some of it. But this is the pattern of cancer incidence going up year by year since 1975, and it's not abating. You know, it's overall cancer for adults is beginning to level off, and in males it's especially because of the decline in lung cancer. And in females, it's a combination, some of the decline is in breast cancer. So the big ones in adults are beginning to level off, but not in children. This picture continues to worry everybody. And then this is another version of the treatment story, which is that deaths due to cancer in kids are coming down as a rate. This is the graph of the rate of childhood cancer mortality in the US up through 2014. Uh, and it's just looking at a little bit shorter time window, but <clears throat> it's a basically a consistent downward trend. So some of these cancers, like particularly childhood leukemia, can be treated in a way that doesn't cause death, uh, at least not during the teenage years. But people still live as teenage cancer survivors, and even more so as childhood cancer goes up and mortality due to childhood cancer goes down. That means there are more people in here that are living with cancer um, that maybe in previous years would have been dead, but uh, it's a burden. It's a burden on them, it's a burden on their families. So that's the goal of this, is to reduce that burden or prevent that burden, ideally. Um, so again, yeah, we've talked about this a bit at, uh, in uh, UMass Lowell. Our colleagues have submitted a journal article. It'll be in the journal Pediatrics later this year, I think in November. Um, and so we call people to take a look at this, uh, teen, teenage cancer as a sort of unexamined trend that's also worrisome. Uh, I took a look at uh, Alaska Native, cancer in Alaska Native children, and I think this reflects what, was, what Vi especially was saying earlier, is that there is a story here, and Dr. Anne Lanier told it at least up until the year 2003, I guess, was her publication. Um, and and it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story that has public health significance. And so it's a way that the science actually does confirm what people are saying and seeing in their communities. And that is that childhood cancer in Alaska Natives is going up. There's one type that seems to be even higher in Alaska Natives than anywhere else, uh, in the US at least, and that's liver cancer in children very rare in general, but especially rare in children, but not so much rare in uh, Alaska Native children. Uh, this article, by the way, has a lot of detail about uh, even regional differences within Native uh, Alaskan populations. So for those that want to dive deeper into that, I recommend uh, Anne, Lan Anne Lanier's uh, paper. And so here's some conclusions. Like I said, I wanted to go through this quickly and then tell a quick story. Um, so childhood cancer is steadily increasing. It's not coming down. Uh, mortality is coming down. Childhood cancer incidence, that's being diagnosed with it, is going up. Dying from it is coming down. It's still a second leading cause of disease death in kids. So there are a lot of other things that are not diseases, like motor vehicle accidents, that cause death in kids. But for diseases, cancer is actually still the leading disease cause of death in uh, children. Uh, one out of 208, this is national statistics, one out of 285 children will be diagnosed before the age of 20, uh, 20 years of age. And then one in 530 adults aged 20 to 39, and this is the people who are living with it, some of whom were diagnosed earlier and are still alive with it. In, ages, in their age 20 to 39, so that's one out of 530 adults. So it's, it's rare, but it's not unheard of. We all probably know such people. Um, and this is the measure of the burden, as I said. And so here's some sort of perfunctory recommendations. More research is needed. Researchers always say that, and they often say more research by me is needed. but. Uh, I think it is true that some of these, as I said, some of these uh, less common associations need to be seen again to, before we really believe them. Uh, but there's plenty to act on already, and so more research would help that. Only 20 or less, 10 to 20 percent, are actually hereditary. There's not much you can do about that. As uh, Charlotte said, you can't change your, ge your genes. Um, and then reduction of carcinogenic exposures to parents, the developing fetus, newborns, and young children will prevent some of this. 
Um, I'm also part of the group that's working on a cancer-free economy or pushing toward a cancer-free economy. Uh, we have an example of that that we think is, makes total sense, which is dry cleaning clothes with chemicals. This tetrachloroethylene, four, four chlorine, two carbon molecule. That's the most common use, that's the most commonly used chemical for dry cleaning. We don't need to do that. We don't need to use that. That chemical causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, bladder cancer, and probably a couple of others. We don't have to clean clothes that way. It doesn't have to expose the workers who do that cleaning, and it doesn't have to expose people who bring the dry cleaning home and hang it up in their closets, and then it's off-gassing into the house. None of that is necessary, because there's an alternative that's <coughs> readily available. This is the precautionary principle. It's not a big leap. It's, it's called wet cleaning. It's basically steam. And the methods of doing that are in hand. It's not like it has to be invented. So we, we feature that as an example. We can have a cancer-free economy. Here's a little you know, case example of that by uh, cleaning clothes by either just washing them or using a, a dry cleaning uh, process that doesn't use chemicals. And then lastly, I'll say a little bit about the term green chemistry. And I'm not sure that we mentioned that yet today. Uh, but green chemistry is the way of thinking about how does nature do this? Or how can we do this in a way that doesn't disrupt national, natural processes and natural rhythms or disrupt other species? And so the green chemistry is sort of a field within the field of chemistry where people are trying to figure out how to do that. And one term has been coined by one of the founders of this field. It's called biomimicry. Let's try to imitate nature or even use nature and, you know, using adhesive that, uh, plants use to climb up walls uh, or that animals use to be able to go up vertical sort that's that kind of adhesive is a natural thing it's not something that has to be created by say dupont or some chemical company and sold at necessarily the profits um, so in any case green chemistry is a way out of this and so is alternatives assessment and i would say that's really implementing the precautionary principle is if we know enough about a chemical to say we shouldn't be using that we need to figure out how to do something else that gets the same result, that's not a regrettable substitution, and that's called alternatives assessment. And both of those fields are beginning and growing, and colleagues of mine are working on both of those. So it's not a hopeless situation, and there is a way out of this, and here's two of them at the bottom of this slide. So that's all of the dull and boring PowerPoint that I wanted to show you. I just wanted to give one example um, of empowered people and how empowered people have actually forced this agenda. And it's a military base example, and it's Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, which is the East Coast place where Marines get their basic training. Um, and so there's a ATSDR, and as somebody also mentioned, I think Vi mentioned, that there are some heroic people in the agencies. Well, there's one at ATSDR uh, whose name is Frank Beauvais. Um, he's an unsung hero. We gave him the Ozanoff Award at Boston University. Dave Ozanoff is our former chair. And uh, it's for people who work within public agencies, serving the public good, and don't get recognized for it. So we gave the Ozanoff Award to Frank Beauvais, mostly because of his work in response to the Marines and their families, the Marine retirees. I sometimes say ex-Marines. There's no such thing as an ex-Marine. They may be retired Marines, but they're still Marines. And they had a, they had a group of them. They had their own website called The Few, The Proud, The Forgotten. And so they started gathering information about people who had ever been at Camp Lejeune. I point at the screen as if it's up there, but it's in North Carolina. Um, and it's a, it's a it, you know, half a million people went through there during a period when the water was severely contaminated with solvents, with especially trichloroethylene, but also perc, perchloroethylene, the dry cleaning solvent. Um, and so they knew that something was wrong amongst their members. They got enough uh, response to their website that they became a pressure point to get AD, uh, ATSDR slash CDC and the Department of Navy to study their health and to come up with an answer. Is this killing us? Is it we think it is? Or actually, as we know it is? You know, do the studies that show this, and then we'll go to Congress and get, you know, them to pass a law to compensate. And it, the, it took about 15 years for that process that I just described to happen. There, there was a community assistance panel established by ATSDR that met, I was a member of that for the 10 years from when it first started in 2006 until earlier this year. Um, and it was an amazing process. I mean, 
partly because these were, these were indefatigable people that were leading it, and they just would not take no for an answer. And in fact, they wouldn't take no for an answer from the Navy or the Marine Commandant, who were saying things that people have mentioned earlier, oh, there's nothing wrong, or you know, if there is, there's nothing we can do about it now, so go away. They wouldn't take that as an answer. Um, and so the Community Assistance Panel was an, an incredibly effective grassroots, in this case, Marine family-based, Marine retirees and their families-based advocacy effort that succeeded. The, it doesn't always go like this. In fact, more often it doesn't go like this. But I just want to tell you that there is an example of citizens determining that there is a problem, insisting that a government agency do something to document it, and then they literally did go to Congress and Congress passed an act to, you can't sue the government, so you have to get Congress to appropriate money, but they got that, believe it or not, from the US Congress in a bipartisan way to compensate family members who had a list of diseases that were linked to these two chemicals that were the exposure, I keep pointing to it, but it's not there. Um, but um, they, they did have a list from the scientific literature of what diseases were likely caused by these uh, chemicals, and sure enough, the Congress passed a law that listed those, or actually uh, ordered the Department of Navy to find those, to make that list, and they are now compensating family members who are not compensated otherwise, like through the VA or some other system. So it can be done, it was done, there's a movie about it, it's called Semper Fi, um, uh, Semper Fi dash Always Faithful, that's the English translation of what Semper Fi means. Um, and there's a book called uh, A Trust Betrayed that document all of this. Um, so I commend that to you and those of you who are advocates, keep the faith. Um, that's my story and I'm going to stick to it. Thanks.